Welcome to Tales of Britain and Ireland. This is a podcast telling the stories, legends and folk tales of Britain and Ireland in no particular order. Presented by Graham and coming direct from South Yorkshire, each episode tells a story or selection of stories from all across these islands and throughout their history, followed by a short and decidedly inexpert discussion of the origin and themes of each tale. In this very first episode, we begin with the story of Thomas the Rhymer. The scene opens on a great medieval banqueting hall in the Scottish town of Earlston, and as befits such a hall, there's a feast going on. The place is absolutely packed with all the things one would expect of a medieval feast. There's heaps of hearty foods, goblets of wine, flagons of ale, There are famous knights, there are ladies clad in fine clothes and probably some of those very pointy hats that medieval ladies wear. It's the very epitome of medieval feastage. And after the bulk of the eating is done, a man stands up at the head of the hall, harp in hand. The previously boisterous room falls silent in hushed anticipation and the assembled guests wait with bated breath for him to sing. And sing he does, like no other bard can, the greatest stories of Britain, of Arthur and the Round Table, and of Merlin and his prophecies, though this man himself has made prophecies of equal renown. And he sings the songs of Tristram and his great love Isult. There's drama and suspense, romance and warfare, there's great melancholy and tremendous joy. The whole rich tapestry of human experience is painted in the minstrel's song. As the night goes on, his audience remain in rapture, until late, late into the evening, the final word of the final sad, sad song is sung, and the last note from the harp hangs in the air. And then, Even the strongest and stoutest of the assembled lords find themselves wiping tears from their cheeks with gauntleted hands. And soon there is a rousing round of bellowing and applause for this, the greatest bard in the land, Thomas the Rhymer. But he was not always so. Let us go back a few years. Unlike in many hotels, the location of this one is set in a definite place and a fairly definite time. The place, the Eildon Hills, in what is known as the Scottish Borders, where Scotland and England meet. The time, the mid-13th century, ish, but definitely in May. Now Huntley Bank is a hillside in the very real Eildon Hills in the Scottish Borders. It's a picturesque area. Think purple heather, golden gorse and babbling brooks, and sweeping views across the same. And it's here we find a young Thomas. He's lying on the hillside, listening to the songs of the birds. Not doing very much at all. He's just soaking in the world. He's probably got his hands behind his head. Now, we're not really told anything about Thomas's background, but given he was able to take a morning to just kick back and chill in the sun and this in medieval times, it's safe to say that he's probably not got too many money worries. He's your typical bored rich kid. Anyway, he's been lying there for some time when he spies a rider come over a nearby hill. Now this might only have been of passing interest to our Thomas, but as the horse gets closer, he can see the stranger is a woman. And not just any woman. Her horse and outfit alike are something to behold. Even from a distance he can see a saddle is made of polished white bone, studded with all kinds of precious stones. Her jewellery is all pearls and diamonds. Her bridle is golden, and the horn she carries? Well, that was golden too. Essentially, she's blinged up to the absolute 13th century max. And if this wasn't enough, she herself is, perhaps inevitably, absolutely beautiful. Now such a person was an uncommon sight to say the least. 
and while Thomas was content to idle away his time when there was nothing better to do, he definitely sensed an opportunity to liven his day up here. Whoever this woman was, he really wanted to speak with her. Seeing the path she was taking would lead her to the notable Eildon tree, Thomas decided this was definitely no time to dally around, and he set off at a run. He arrived under the branches of the tree at the same time she did, and our Thomas didn't hold back, but pulled out his best line immediately. Kneeling down before the magnificent horse, he addressed the rider. Lovely lady, you must be the Queen of Heaven. Now you, like me, might think that that's a little strong on the really obvious flattery side. It could so easily be interpreted as being sarcastic at that. Queen of Heaven? Come on. But Thomas wasn't one for playing it cool, and it seemed to pay off for him. For the woman replied, thanking Thomas for his sweet words, but corrected his assumedly sincere mistake. No, not the Queen of Heaven. I have no such high rank. No, I am of another country, simply out hunting. As she spoke, Thomas could make out in more detail the riches that adorned her and her horse. A green silk skirt, a velvet coat, the effect topped off by crystal stirrups and bells hung around her steed. And not only was she beautiful, but she even seemed to glow with her white radiance. Thomas, of course, didn't stop and think to ask questions about how someone from another country came to be riding around the hills. He'd got this far, talking to her and all, and so he thought he may as well see it through to its logical conclusion. Now, what happens next differs in different versions of the story, in a way that is crucial for understanding the motivations of our as-yet-unidentified rider. In one version of the story, she propositions a more than willing Thomas. In the other he is the one to make the first move. Now in either case, she exceeds only after warning him, in somewhat cryptic terms, of non-specific consequences. At this point I'd like to think Thomas, showing even the tiniest bit of common decency, swallowed hard before leaping all the way in with the question. Lovely lady, could you lie with me? Thomas could probably scarce believe his luck when the woman didn't just say, get stuffed. Rather, she replied, you can have your way if you truly will it. But beware, that way folly lies for you. For Thomas, this was promising. Possibly the most promising reaction he'd ever had. Lovely lady, he repeated. If I could be with thee, I pledge myself to you in marriage and would follow you anywhere you went even to heaven and hell. Well, you've been warned, she replied, in an ominous way that Thomas completely missed. And at that she dismounted, and she did proceed to lie with Thomas underneath the Eildon tree. Seven times, in fact. It was pretty good for both of them. When they were done, they basked in what, after that many times, must have been one hell of a postcoital glow. Thomas turned to his new love, and immediately recoiled away. The radiant beauty he had left was gone, and in her place was someone very different. Her hair was grey, her face was hideous, her body looked though it was made of beaten lead. Even her rich clothes had melted away. Thomas reacted as one might have expected with some general screaming and cursing, leaping up, preparing to flee, and calling on God to free him from this devil from hell. But as it turned out, her appearance was the least of Thomas's troubles. Whether it was due to his hastily given promise of everlasting devotion, or simply through some magic of their union, the now far from shining woman announced to Thomas that he was bound to her for seven years. And in that time, she added, He would see no moon, no sun, and no more the leaves of the Eildon tree. And so saying, she grasped Thomas, pulled him up onto her horse with an unnatural strength, and the two set off, riding under the tree and straight inside the hill.
perhaps you might be considering that something going slightly awry should have been expected by Thomas. Beautiful, willing, rich women, not generally given to appearing out of nowhere. Not to mention all the warning that the woman very clearly gave to him. But if we were to be generous to Thomas, I suppose we could chalk this one up to youthful naivety and enthusiasm. We can hope he might learn a lesson about getting to know people a little better before jumping right in. Communication is very important. Anyway, back to Thomas, and the woman who can now most accurately be described as his kidnapper. It was black under the hill, dark as midnight. There weren't the rocks and earth you might expect. In fact, there was nothing solid at all. And as they rode on, water splashed around them. And they rode like this for three days. Conversation during this time seems to have been non-existent. Perhaps Thomas tried to strike up a chat, but was told by his kidnapper to be silent. Perhaps he was simply embarrassed. Like when you get into a taxi and don't start a conversation immediately, and then it's silent. So you feel you should say something, but it's already been too long, and now you can't say anything because it's awkward. But with the added complication that you, or in this case Thomas, have just had sex with the taxi driver, and are being abducted. Even so, three whole days was really pushing the boundaries of awkwardness, and also seems like a very long time to be on a horse. Thinking about saddle sore here. Even more pressingly, the gnawing emptiness in Thomas's stomach was getting worse and worse. Eventually, this got to him so much that he just had to break social convention. I- excuse me, I'm sorry, but if I don't get any food soon, I'm, I'm going to die. Literally. Now possibly the need for humans to eat and drink had just not occurred to his supernatural abductress, because just as soon as he had finished complaining about his impending starvation, the pair emerged from the darkness into the light. And into a garden. And once Thomas's eyes had adjusted, he was presented with a beautiful sight. There were all kinds of trees with delicious and luscious looking fruits. Apples and pears, dates, figs and plums. A wealth of tasty treasures for a hungry man. In the treetops up above, huge varieties of birds sang and played. Nightingales, thrushes and even parrots sung their songs and built their nests. Truly, it was a vision of paradise. Thomas rather felt that his luck had changed dramatically once again. And as they dismounted, which must have been some fair relief itself, Thomas reached out to pluck an apple, only to be sharply rebuked by his kidnapper. Thomas, leave that well alone. It's cursed. And if you eat it, you'll be forever damned to hell and eternal suffering with no chance of reprieve. I can only imagine Thomas gave a really big sigh and looked at the apple longingly before sadly tossing it away. As he did this, the woman was sitting herself upon the ground, and presumably taking pity upon the starving man, she said, But look here, I've got a loaf of bread and some wine. After he'd eaten and drunk his fill, the lady beckoned him. Come hither, Thomas, and lie here upon my lap. There's something I want to show you. And really without any other options, Thomas did just that. And as he lay, the woman pointed out to him the roads that led away from the garden. First, a narrow, winding path full of briars, thorns, nettles and the like. It did not look like somewhere a sensible traveller might want to venture. Now that, said the lady, that is the road to righteousness, though few people take that twisted route. And in the other direction, she said, indicating a broad, well-tended way. That is the road to wickedness. This heavy-handed moral lesson concluded, she pointed to a third path, which wound around the green hill ahead. And that, that is the road to fair elf land. And that is where we're going today. That's my country, she added, before casually dropping in the big reveal. 
the country of which I am Queen. And a few moments after that, Thomas and the Queen of the Fairies were on the horse and off again. A quick aside about the whole fair elf land here. Now I don't want to get too sidetracked discussing the elves slash fairies, but it's definitely worth getting out of your head any idea of either little cute flower painting children with wings, or beautiful blonde statuesque Tolkien elves, though the latter is probably closer in the story of Thomas. Fairies are found everywhere across European folklore, and have a huge host of different characteristics depending on the story that they're in. The common elements are some kind of intelligent, humanoid, magical race of beings who occupy both our world and some other realm not easily accessible to mankind. They are neither divine nor demonic, but, like humanity, somewhere in between. Now, their interactions with humans tend to vary as they themselves do. Sometimes they're helpful, other times they play irritating tricks, and other times they're downright malevolent and dangerous. On balance, they are usually something to be feared. The best way to understand what they are like is probably within the boundaries of the story being told, without worrying too much about how they link up to all the other different kind of fairies in all the other folk stories. It doesn't work that way. Think about how aliens are used across all kinds of different stories now, but are very different depending on the book or movie that they're shown in. Now, in the story of Thomas, the fairies seem to be fairly similar to humans, even having a courtly society, but are also just a bit better, grander, more magic, more beautiful and the like. But anyway, let's get back to the story. Still without any real idea of what was going to happen to him, Thomas was just adjusting to the identity of his kidnapper when she decided to casually drop a few more complications into the increasingly overwhelming mix. Matter of factly, she told him, Now, if the king were to find out that I lay with you, we'll both be for hanging and drawing. So when we arrive, you must be courteous, but if anyone asks you questions, respond only to me. When we arrive at the castle, the king will be having a feast with 30 of his barons, and I'm going to tell them that I took the power of speech from you when we met at the Eildon Tree. Unfortunately for Thomas, it turned out that the Queen really liked to live rather dangerously. Thomas's feelings at this point are not recorded, but it is said that he stood still as stone, and I can only imagine the absolute horror of anticipation at the prospect of meeting with the potentially murderous King of the Elves. As the Fairy Queen's horse arrived at the castle, she blew her horn to announce her arrival. And as poor kidnapped Thomas was led into the hall of the fairy king, his thoughts turned to his almost certain doom. This could not go well. And cut to a couple of days later. And things were going well. Better than well, in fact. Really, really good. Everything had gone to plan. The queen had led him in, and he followed behind. All the people of the fairy court were there. The noblemen and women, the kings, the barons. All of them greeted the queen, swallowed the mute at the Eildon tree line, and no one suspected a thing about him. Thomas was on edge for a while, but when everyone persisted in not bringing it up, or even in paying him any special attention at all, he started to relax. Perhaps the queen regularly just magically silenced humans. And so he learned all about the fairy court. And the most obvious fact about the fairy court was that they really liked to party. And how. There were all kinds of minstrels, glorious feasting, dancing, more pretty ladies than he could shake a stick at. One day they'd all gone hunting with the great dogs and killed many deer, which, while it might be frowned upon now, was absolutely the height of entertainment at the time. And Thomas loved it. What's more, the whole thing about not seeing the sun or moon for seven years? Well, that was seeming like a technicality. Yes, they were in Fair Elf Land, so there was no sun or moon, as on Earth. But the whole place basically still had the same light cycle, 
and maybe with a little less chance of skin cancer. Also, the Queen actually seemed to like Thomas. I mean, she hadn't actually made him mute or anything, which has to count for something. And she had risked the whole King hanging her thing, which, while not a great move as far as Thomas was concerned, at least showed she cared. In a creepy kind of way. Now, there was still the whole kidnapping thing, and he should definitely have words about that at some point. But this was the early Middle Ages, and at least their relationship had started out on a pretty equitable basis, and she seemed cool now. She'd taken him to this place where the partying was really, really good, even if he couldn't talk to anyone but her. But, hey, who needs to talk when there's hunting to be had? While sitting a dance out, Thomas looked around at the fairy hall and thought to himself, this seven years is going to be just fine. It was at precisely this juncture that the Queen came up beside him. My lovely lady, began Thomas, always the charmer, but she cut him off. You have got to leave right now. I'm taking you back to the Eildon Tree. He protested. I've only been here for a few days, and I want to stay. You said seven years. The Queen looked at him quite deliberately, and a bit like he was an idiot. Thomas, it has been almost seven of your years. By this point, Thomas had had just about enough of the roller coaster of emotions he'd gone through over the past few days. Let's have a review, shall we? Good times with a beautiful, willing, and able lady. Fantastic! That woman actually turning out to be the Queen of the Fairies, who cursed him to leave home for seven years. Bad. That was bad. Pitch darkness for days and starvation. Another tick in the negative column, that one. Being taken out of that into a garden full of delectable looking fruit. Good. Being told eating the fruit would condemn him to the fires of hell. Very bad. Finally getting some food and wine. Good. Being told all about the king probably wanting to murder them both. Very bad. Finding out that the queen's plan worked and the king didn't have a clue, and the partying being awesome. Well, yep, yeah, that was really good. Finding out that the handful of days he'd spent with the fairies had been seven actual years. Pretty bad. It's really quite fair to say that telling the whole story was not exactly the Queen's strong point. Thomas was diplomatically trying to put together words to that effect when the Queen obliged to explain a little more. You see, every seven years, we fairies must pay a tithe to hell. A soul. And in the morning, a fiend will be coming from that accursed place to collect. Now you are a handsome human man, and as such, your soul will be highly prized by him. That beast will smell you out, and if it finds you here, it will pursue you to the very ends of the world. Ah, handsome, Thomas blushed, but only briefly, before fully digesting what the Queen was saying. By this point, Thomas must have been doing some very serious development of the skill, having to assimilate seemingly very unlikely and shocking information very quickly. So perhaps he was able to adapt, and less open jaw than on previous occasions. Now, I'm not having your soul eaten just for me, Thomas, so I'm taking you back. And so they set off yet again, leaving the musicians, hunters, and pretty knights and ladies of Fair Elf Land behind them. Presently, the two of them found themselves back on Earth and under the Eildon Tree. This is farewell. I can see you no longer said the Queen, saddling up her horse. But suddenly, for the first time since they met, Thomas showed some initiative. Perhaps he realised that being away for seven years and not having aged a day was likely to lead to awkward questions. Or maybe he was just feeling pretty shafted by this whole whirlwind kidnapping affair business that he hadn't been given any opportunity to consent to. But whatever the reason, before she set off, he piped up. Lady, Give me some token that will show that I have spoken with you. She halted in her departure and turned. Okay, she said. Choose one. Do you want to be a great singer and lyricist, or a great player of the harp? And Thomas felt that oh-so-familiar feeling of his look changing yet again. It was an interesting choice. 
Perhaps there was no wrong answer. He considered, though. It is the songs that are the most important as a chief talent of a minstrel. So it shall be, said the Queen, before adding, perhaps under her breath. Also, you'll never be able to tell a lie. And then she quickly adds that, you'll also never be able to speak ill of me. Now, having to give the caveat, you'll never be able to speak ill of me, directly after stopping someone from lying, rather suggests the Queen knows she's not 100% one of the good guys. What kind of an awful gift is that? said Thomas. Which makes him either the quickest person ever to catch on to mythological blessings which are really just curses, or just already not being able to lie. How am I going to be able to buy or sell at market now? A worse consequence occurred to him. Or talk to ladies. Or talk to noble lords. Or talk to anybody for that matter. To which the Queen basically replied, I've said it, I make the rules, that's that. But, I tell you what, what I will do is give you some knowledge of the future. Now Thomas in his lifetime would become famed for his prophecies, and it is often said that the Queen gave him the ability to see the future. But that's not strictly accurate. Rather, just before she readied to leave forever, the Queen proceeded to reel off to Thomas a lengthy amount of prophecies, in verse. I can only imagine the poor man desperately scrabbling around for a pencil and some paper as she began. I don't intend to give most of the prophecies here. Whilst for the medieval authors who recorded these they would have formed a key part of the story, they aren't perhaps of much interest to a modern audience. But here's a couple of them, for the feel of it. A Scottish king shall come full keen, the ruddy lion bear of he, a feathered arrow sharp I ween, shall make him wink and wire to see, when he is bloody and all too bled, thus to his men he still shall say, For God's sake, turn ye back again, and give yon southern folk a fray. Why should I lose? The right is mine. My doom is not to die this day. Great Scottish prophecy there, fighting the English. It's going to be a crowd pleaser. Here's another. Beside a headless cross of stone, the libards there shall lose the gree. The raven shall come, the urn shall go, and drink the Saxon blood so free. The cross of stone they shall not know, so thick their corpses there shall be. More dead English, it's going to go down well. Now finally, after relating her many, many prophecies, and with Thomas presumably repeating them over and over, desperately trying to commit them all to memory, the Queen made to leave. Shall I see you again? asked Thomas. Aye, replied the Queen. One day, when the hind and hart by moonlight roam, return here to Huntley Bank, and here I shall be. And with that, she was gone. And so, Armed only with a wonderful talent for poetry and song and a pile of prophecies, Thomas set out into the world. And if his unexplained absence of seven years or that tricksy inability to lie caused him any problems, we don't hear about them. In fact, all that seems to have come Thomas's way after the events related here were fame and fortune. No longer an idle boy, he grew into a man with a purpose. True Thomas, they called him or Thomas the Rhymer, in recognition of his honesty and his lyrical genius. As word of him spread, he found himself invited to all the best banquets, entertained the richest lords of Scotland and the Borderlands. No one was more in demand for singing the romances, while his prophecies were received with reverential respect by many a warring king, desperate to see whether good or ill would come their way. And so we return to where we began. On a snowy night in Thomas's hometown of Earlston. A few hours previous, Thomas's draw-dropping performance in the castle had been met with loud tears, cheers and standing ovations. But now, all who watched it have retired to their beds. But in the town below, something strange is happening. And presently, Lord Douglas is awakened from his bed to investigate. 
and what he finds is this. Two deer, one a stag or hart, and the other a doe or hind, were walking calmly through the town together. An unusual sight to say the least. Deliberately, they strode across the snow-carpeted streets, ignoring the astonished crowds that had begun to gather to watch them. Lord Douglas surveyed the situation, stroked his chin for a little, and considered. Send for true Thomas. And so, Thomas was roused from his bed, unclothed, and came himself to see what the disturbance was all about. And when he saw it, he knew what he must do. He followed the hind and the hart down to Huntley Bank, stopping occasionally to cast a few glances back at the castle and the town, soaking in as much of the human world as he could, and no doubt remembering the stories he wove and the pleasures of his life there. And though Lord Douglas took up his fastest horse to pursue Thomas, he soon found he could see the man no more. And indeed, in all the lands of the living, Thomas was never seen again. that's it, the story of Thomas the Rhymer. A little bit of background on this. The story of Thomas is originally recorded as a medieval romance, found in a number of manuscripts with slight differences between the tales. Thomas himself appears to have been a real person to some degree. His name crops up in a number of medieval works as a prophet and as a composer of romances. The real Thomas seems to have been someone of genuine fame and importance. However, Who exactly he was, the exact time he lived, and what he actually did is very difficult to pin down, perhaps unsurprisingly for someone who lived over 700 years ago. In modern day Elston there is a structure known as the Rhymer's Tower, but this was named after him, and there seems to be no direct tie back to the historical figure. Similarly, there is a stone that marks where the Eildon tree apparently once stood, however it seems very unlikely that this is actually the one referred to in the story. Rather, a later tree had become attached to the name once the story became more famous. A variant of the story later than the medieval versions, referred to as the ballad version, was collected in the 19th century by a number of folklore collectors. The influence of folklore collectors from the 19th century on the canon of British and indeed European folk tales available today cannot be overstated, and in the case of this tale, the version of the ballad we have today comes primarily from Anna Gordon, a renowned Scottish ballad collector of the late 18th century. It was then published by Sir Walter Scott, himself a hugely important Scottish author. Scott made his own additions to the ballad, inspired in part by the legend. Now, the story I've just related is a mishmash of various different sources and doesn't quite correspond to any particular version. However, they're all broadly the same in general outline. However, in the medieval versions, the prophecies are of much greater importance, though their actual connection with the historical Thomas seems somewhat suspect. The manuscripts make reference to key events in Scottish history, with the written prophecies having been retrofitted to events, or even composed entirely after them. For instance, one of the most famous prophecies is said to predict the rule of Scotland and England by James I, but it was probably meant for someone else entirely. All kinds of prophecies seem to have been attributed to Thomas, which did not have a great deal to do with him. It's easy to dismiss this bit of the story from a modern perspective, but I was particularly amused when I could almost hear the contempt dripping in Walter Scott's words about one particular prophecy. Quote, Another prediction ascribed to Rhymer seems to have been founded on that sort of insight into futurity possessed by most men of a sound of combining judgment. It runs thus. At Eildon Tree, if you shall be, a brig over the Tweed you there may see. That spot in question, of course, commands an extensive prospect of the course of the river, and it is easy to foresee that, when the country should become in the least degree improved, a bridge would be thrown up over the stream. In fact, you can now see no less than three bridges from that elevated situation. End quote. As for the ballad itself, 
It's a relatively well-known story, and sung versions of it have been recorded by a few artists, Ewan McCall and Steel Eye Span perhaps most famously. I'd suggest checking them out. They tell this whole story a lot faster than I just have, and it all rhymes. Now as for the story itself, what I find most interesting about it, which is true to every version, is the complete passivity of Thomas in what is ostensibly his own story. Though the story is named after him, it's really about the Queen, as it's she who leads all the action throughout. She kidnaps him, feeds him, takes him back when she wants to, gives him all his powers when he does diddly squat throughout all of it. Possibly the only exception is at the start where he takes the initiative in asking her, though in some versions even that's different. In either case she seems pretty ready to get with him, so it's hardly as if he woos her. Thomas has no heroic arc. He doesn't cleverly steal the secrets of singing or do anything at all. He's just a random dude who the Queen picks up and then dumps, seemingly just because she can. In fact, we're not told much at all about her motivation, and it may be a thoroughly modern reading of the story, but it's that that I want to know more about. She does care about Thomas enough for him not to get killed, but she also takes him away for seven years. Is she just ignorant? Is he just a fling? Why does she give him the gifts he gets? It all remains a bit of a mystery. All in all, it makes her a very interesting character, and that is even more so considered in a wider context. Because, while everything may have come up smelling of roses for Thomas, next time we'll be looking at another tale involving the Queen and the Fairy Court, and see that events might have worked out very differently indeed. You can follow Tales of Britain and Ireland podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's also a website, talesofbritainandireland.com, where there's a page for each episode which contains more information including illustrations, asides and recaps along with other additional bits and pieces to explore. The intro music was written and performed by Alice Nichols, and you can find all the other musical credits on the episode page on the website. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please do share it with others or give it a review, as those really are the best ways to help us out. You can also join Tales of Britain and Ireland on Patreon to get extra members episodes. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me again soon. (laughs) 